His library seemed the source of his habitual odour of Russian leather. Row upon row of calf-bound volumes, brown and olive, with gilt lettering on their spines, the octavo in brilliant scarlet Morocco. A deep buttoned leather sofa to recline on, a lectern, carved like a spread eagle, that held open upon it an edition of Huysman's Le Bain, from some over-exquisite private press. It had been bound like a missile in brass, with gems of coloured glass. The rugs on the floor, deep, pulsing blues of heaven and red of the heart's dearest blood, came from Ifsahan and Bokhara. The dark panelling gleamed. There was the lulling music of the sea and a fire of apple logs. The flames flickered along the spines inside a glass-fronted case that held books still crisp and new. Alphas Levy. The name meant nothing to me. I squinted at a title or two. The Initiation, The Key of Mysteries, The Secret of Pandora's Box, and beyond. Nothing. Nothing here to detain a seventeen-year-old girl waiting for her first embrace. I should have liked, best of all, a novel in yellow paper. I wanted to curl up on the rug before the blazing fire, lose myself in a cheap novel, munch sticky liqueur chocolates. If I rang for them, the maid would bring me the chocolates. Nevertheless, I opened the doors of the bookcase idly to browse, and I think I knew, I knew by some tingling at the fingertips, even before I opened that slim volume with no title at all on the spine, what I should find inside. And when he showed me the robs, newly bought, dearly prized, had he not hinted that he was a connoisseur of such things? Yet I had not bargained for this. The girl with the tears hanging on her cheeks like stuck pearls. Her, a split fig below the great globes of her buttocks, on which the knotted tails of the cat were about to descend, while a man in a black mask fingered with his free hand his, that curved upwards like the scimitar he held. And the picture had a caption, Reproof of Curiosity. My mother, with all that precision of her eccentricity, had told me what it was that lovers did. I was innocent, but not naive. The adventures of Yuli at the harem of the Grand Turk had been printed according to the Flyleaf in Amsterdam in 1748. A rare collector's piece. Had some ancestor brought it back himself from that northern city, or had my husband bought it for himself from one of those dusty little bookshops on the left bank, where an old man peers at you through spectacles an inch thick, daring you to inspect his wares? I turned the pages in anticipation of fear. The print was rusty. Here was another steel engraving immolation of the wives of the sultan. I knew enough for what I saw in that book to make me gasp. There was a pungent intensification of the odour of leather that suffused his library. His shadow fell across the massacre. <laughs> My little nun has found the prayer books, has she? he demanded, with a curious mixture of mockery and relish. Then, seeing my painful, furious bewilderment, he laughed at me aloud, snatched the book from my hands, and put it down on the sofa. Have the nasty pictures scared Baby? Baby mustn't play with grown-up's toys until she's learned how to handle them, must she? Then he kissed me. And with this time, 
no reticence. He kissed me and laid his hand imperatively upon my breast, beneath the sheath of ancient lace. I stumbled on the winding stair that led to the bedroom, to the carved, gilded bed on which he had been conceived. I stammered foolishly. We've... We've not taken luncheon yet. And, and, and besides, it's, it's broad daylight. All the better to see you. He made me put on my choker, the family heirloom of one woman who had escaped the blade. With trembling fingers, I fastened the thing around my neck. It was cold as ice, it chilled me. He twined my hair into a rope and lifted it off my shoulders so that he could better kiss the downy furrows behind my ears. That made me shudder. He kissed those blazing rubies too. He kissed them before he kissed my mouth. Wrapped, he intoned, with her apparel she retains only her sonorous jewellery. A dozen husbands impaled a dozen brides, while the mewing gulls swung on invisible trapezes in the empty air outside. I was brought to my senses by the insistent shrilling of a telephone. He lay beside me, felled like an oak, breathing stertorously, as if he'd been fighting with me. In the course of that one-sided struggle, I'd seen his deathly composure shatter like a porcelain vase swung against a wall. I'd heard him shriek and blaspheme at the orgasm. I'd bled. And perhaps I had seen his face without his mask. And perhaps I had not. Yet I had been infinitely dishevelled by the loss of my virginity. I gathered myself together reached into the cloisonne cupboard beside the bed that concealed the telephone and addressed the mouthpiece. His agent in New York. Urgent. I shook him awake and rolled over on my side, cradling my spent body in my arms. His voice buzzed like a hive of distant bees. My husband. My husband, who, with so much love, filled my bedroom with lilies until it looked like an embalming parlour. Those somnolent lilies that wave their heavy heads, distributing their lush, insolent incense reminiscent of pampered flesh. When he'd finished with the agent, he turned to me and stroked the ruby necklace that bit into my neck. But with such tenderness now that I ceased flinching, and he caressed my breasts. My dear one, my little love, my child, did it hurt her? He's so sorry for it, such impetuousness, he could not help himself. You see, he loves her so. And this love is recitative of his, brought my tears in a flood. I clung to him, as though the only one who had inflicted the pain could comfort me for suffering it. For a while, he murmured to me in a voice I'd never heard before, a voice like the soft consolations of the sea. But then he unwound the tendrils of my hair from the buttons of his smoking jacket, kissed my cheek briskly, and told me the agent from New York had called with such urgent business that he must leave as soon as the tide was low enough. Leave the castle. Leave France. And would be away for at least six weeks. But it is our honeymoon. A deal. An enterprise of hazard and chance involving several millions lay in the balance, he said. He drew away from me into that waxwork stillness of his. I was only a little girl. I did not understand. And he said unspoken to my wounded vanity, 
I have had too many honeymoons to find them in the least pressing commitments. And I know quite well that this child I've bought with a handful of coloured stones and the pelts of dead beasts won't run away. But after he'd called his Paris agent to book a passage for the States next day, just one tiny call, my little one, we should have dinner together. And I had to be content with that. A Mexican dish of pheasant with hazelnuts and chocolate. Salad. White, voluptuous cheese. A sorbet of muscat grapes and asti spumante. A celebration of Krug exploded festively. And then acrid black coffee in precious little cups so fine it shadowed the birds with which they were painted. I had contrio and he had cognac in the library, with the purple velvet curtains drawn against the night, where he took me to perch on his knee in a leather armchair beside the flickering log fire. He had made me change into that chaste little shift of white muslin. He seemed especially fond of it, but he would not let me take off my ruby choker, although it was grown very uncomfortable, nor fasten up my descending hair the sign of a virginity so recently ruptured that still remained a wounded presence between us. He twined his fingers in my hair until I winced. The maid will have changed our sheets already, he said. We do not hang the bloody sheets out of the window to prove to the whole of Brittany you are a virgin. Not in these civilised times. But I should tell you it would have been the first time in all my married lives that I could have shown my interest in telling such a flag. And then I realised, with a shock of surprise, how it must have been my innocence that captivated him. The silent music, he said, of my unknowingness. Like le des audiences au clair de lune, played upon a piano with keys of ether. You must remember how ill at ease I was in that luxurious place. How unease had been my constant companion during the whole length of my courtship by this grave satyr, who now gently martyrised my hair. To know that my naivety gave him some pleasure made me take heart. Courage. I shall act the fine lady to the manner born one day, if only virtue of default. Then, slowly, Yet, teasingly, as if he were giving a child a great, mysterious treat, he took out a bunch of keys from some interior hidey-hole in his jacket. Key after key. A key, he said, for every lock in the house. Keys of all kinds. Huge, ancient things of black iron. Others slender, delicate, almost baroque. Wafer-thin Yale keys for safes and boxes. And during his absence, it was I who must take care of them all. I eyed the heavy bunch with circumspection. Until that moment, I had not given a single thought to the practical aspects of marriage with a great house, great wealth, a great man whose key ring was as crowded as that of a prison warder. Here were the clumsy and archaic keys for the dungeons. The dungeons we had in plenty although they had been converted to cellars for his wines. The dusty bottles inhabited in racks, all those deep holes of pain in the rock on which the castle was built. These are the keys to the kitchens. This is the key to the picture gallery, a treasure house filled with five centuries of avid collectors. Ah, he foresaw I would spend hours in there. He had amply indulged his taste for symbolists, he told me. With a, greed, with a glint of greed. There was Moreau's great portrait of his first wife, the famous sacrificial victim, with the imprint of the lace-like chains on her pellucid skin. Did I know the story of the painting of that picture? How, when she took off her clothes for him for the first time, she, fresh from her bar on Montmartre, she had robed herself involuntarily in a blush that reddened her breasts, her shoulders, her arms, her whole body. He had thought of that story, of that dear girl, when he first had undressed me. End song.
the great Ensel, his monolithic canvas, the foolish virgins, two or three late gorgons, his special favourite, the one of the tranced brown girl in the deserted house which was called Out of the Night We Come, Into the Night We Go. And besides the additions he had made himself, his marvellous inheritance of Watteau of Poisson, and a pair of very special Fragonards, commissioned for licentious ancestor who, it was said, had posed for the master's brush himself with his own two daughters. He broke off his catalogue of treasures abruptly. Your thin white face, Chérie, he said, as if he saw it for the first time. Your thin white face with its promise of debauchery only a connoisseur could detect. A log fell in the fire, instigating a shower of sparks. The opal on my finger spurted green flame. I felt giddy as if I were on the edge of a precipice. I was afraid. Not so much of him, of his monstrous presence, heavy as if he had been gifted at birth with more specific gravity than the rest of us. The presence that, even when I thought myself most in love with him, always subtly oppressed me. No, I was not afraid of him, but of myself. I seemed reborn in his unreflective eyes, reborn in unfamiliar shapes. I hardly recognised myself in his descriptions of me, and yet, yet might there not be a grain of beastly truth in them? And in the red firelight, I blushed again, unnoticed, to think he might have chosen me, because, in my innocence, he sensed a rare talent for corruption. Here is the key to the china cabinet. <laughs> Don't laugh, my darling. There's a king's ransom in Severs in that closet, and a queen's ransom in Limoges, and a key to the locked, barred room where five generations of plate were kept. Keys, keys, keys. He would trust me with the keys to his office, although I was only a baby. And the keys to his safes, where he kept the jewels I should wear, he promised me when we returned to Paris. Such jewels. Why, I would be able to change my earrings and necklaces three times a day, just as the Empress Josephine used to change her underwear. He doubted, he said, with that hollow, knocking sound that served him for a chuckle. I would be quite so interested in his share certificates, although they, of course, were worth infinitely more. Outside our firelit privacy, I could hear the sound of the tide drawing back from the pebbles on the foreshore. It was nearly time for him to leave me. One single key remained unaccounted for on the ring, and he hesitated over it for a moment. For a moment, I thought he was going to unfasten it from its brothers, slip it back into his pocket, and take it away from him. What is that key? I demanded, for his chafing had made me bold. <laughs> the key to your heart? Give it me! He dangled the key tantalisingly above my head out of reach of my straining fingers. Those bare red lips of his cracked sidelong into a smile. Ah, no, he said. Not the key to my heart. Rather, the key to my enfa. He left it on the ring, fastened the ring together, and shook it musically, like a carillon. Then he threw the keys in a jingling heap in my lap. I could feel the cold metal chilling my thighs through my thin muslin frock. He bent over me to drop a beard mask kiss on my forehead. <laughs> Every man must have one secret, even if only one from his wife, he said. Promise me this, my way-faced piano player. Promise me you'll use all the keys on the ring, except that last little one I showed you. Play with anything you find, jewels, silver plate, 
make toy boats out of my share certificates if it pleases you, and send them sailing off to America after me. All is yours. Everywhere is open to you. Except the lock that this single key fits. Yet all it is is the key to a little room at the foot of the west tower. Behind the still room at the end of the dark little corridor full of horrid cobwebs that you would get in your hair and frighten you if you ventured there. Oh, and you'd find it such a dull little room. But you must promise me, if you love me, to leave it well alone. It is only a private study, a, a hideaway, a, a den, as the English say, where I can go sometimes on those infrequent yet inevitable occasions where the yoke of marriage seems to weigh so heavily on my shoulders. There I can go, you understand, to savour the rare pleasure of imagining myself wifeless. There was a thin metal starlight in the courtyard, it was wrapped in my furs. I saw him to his car. His last words were that he had telephoned the mainland and taken a piano tuner on the staff. The man would arrive to take up his duties the next day. He pressed me to his breast once, then drove away. <laughs>